Um, all right, here we are uh, to listen to Dr. Home Wellafar. He is running a very active research lab and has always had thriving group of students working with him. Uh, I'll pass it on to him. Right. So hello everyone. As uh, Dr. Shep mentioned, my name is uh, Home Wellafar. I'm a professor in computer science and engineering. And what I'd like to do is uh, give you first a broad overview of the areas of research that you're currently taking on in my research lab. And from there, I picked one to dig deeper into it, not necessarily because I think it's, it's, it's kind of a thing that's in computational biology and generally computer science students don't really kind of want to hear anything about biology, but I thought it's the thing that's most current especially in, uh, related to our pandemic with COVID-19. And it's a topic that you guys hear the least about. So I thought from a pedagogical point of view it would be the most uh, efficient way, most uh, instrumental thing to do. So what I'm gonna do is uh, unless, should, should I do maybe ahead of time audio check? Is my audio okay? Yeah, your audio is fine. And if, uh, if you do not mind, I'm going to turn off my video. I'm not sure what kind of a bandwidth I have here and what's going to happen to it. Um, but if anybody wants to see me in particular, just let me know and I'm happy to turn it on. So um, let me go ahead and share my screen. <clears throat> you guys, can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. So uh, generally in my laboratory, and by the way, uh, please, uh, if, if you have questions, feel free to interrupt and ask questions. I understand class goes until 3.10. So I'm gonna try to stay on time, make sure maybe give you some time to ask questions at the end. But if you have questions during the discussion, I'm happy to entertain them as we go along. So generally the, the overall theme of research in my lab is how can computer science help in medicine and healthcare? And in that really broad overview of the entire community of what everybody's doing, so computer science really is instrumental key player in the area of medicine and healthcare. Going into the future, computer science is gonna become even more prominent. And some of the examples are of the areas of, uh, of computer science that's contributing is uh, in protein structure calculation, active site protein engineering. I'm gonna, from time to time when the opportunity comes in my presentation, I'm gonna kind of try to relate what I'm showing to some of these items. In genomics and transcriptomics, transcriptom this is where we can potentially correct diseases and genetic diseases. Um, clinical decision systems, this is where we are developing systems to assist physicians to better diagnose problems and better help all patients in recovery and patient outcome. And one of the clear examples is diagnostic medical image recognition, which is really prominently out there, um, but it is not making the impact that it should. And some of it connects to economics, some of it connects to politics, but some of it connects also to practicalities of the, of the domain. So going back to my lab, this is where I'm presenting the overview of my lab. And let me um, preemptively state that I, I am in the process of hiring students. So I, I would like to encourage anybody who's not affiliated, who is looking for research areas, please consider this. And I have designed part of what I'm presenting in the context of if a student was to join my lab, what kinds of expectations would be in place. Um, I am looking for a number of long-term, short-term um, hires, short-term meaning for maybe summer, long-term meaning as much as four years. So if you're interested in any of the things that I'm presenting today, please contact me. So in the context of activities that my lab takes, we take on all three items of we train people, we provide service to people, and we also advance science, which basically is the research. We are funded currently by NIH. And sorry, so um, as far as provide services, this is something that I expect all members of my lab to participate in. Let me make sure. So we provide service to all 
members of the community. So my lab is part of a project called Embry that we reach out towards 13, 14 institutions across South Carolina and outside of South Carolina, where they come to us with a variety of needs, some very sophisticated, some very simple, but it could be anywhere from project uh, design of experimental projects, consultation on how they can conduct their experimentations. We can analyze data for them. We can warehouse data. We can create websites. We can create databases. So we kind of engage in service, provision of services to the community. We also provide training. And training can be anything in the realm of proteomics, genomics, biostatistics, programming. Um, some of the examples of these that we have done in the past has been, for example, how to program, analyze data in R, Python, AI-based machine learning, um, even as simple as Linux or as sophisticated as how to perform uh, deep learning in Python. So all of these are things that we provide as training sessions to a variety of organizations. We travel around, we provide training sessions remotely. And again, I would like to ask my students to participate, all members of the lab, whether you're a student postdoc to participate in all of these activities. So more focused in the area of research, we basically approach healthcare from two ends, from the very, very top down approach and also from bottom up approach. And from top down approach, this is where we approach the entire healthcare of human being as a systemic concept where we kind of engage in treatment diagnostics, prognostics, and prevention of diseases. So this is disease related at the, at the upper level of human and management of the patients. But then at the same time, we engage the study of diseases at the molecular basis. And if you take any one disease, whether it's a common cold, whether it's COVID-19, whether it's um, Alzheimer's, any of these, at the top level, we got patient symptoms, signs, and there are issues related to management, treatment. But then at the very, very molecular basis, there is a reason why people develop these diseases and ailments. So we kind of approach it from both ends. From the perspective of treatment and intervention, some of the examples that we have worked on, that I'm just going to highlight here, I do have slides related to each one of them. So if, you're, if there's an interest, let me know. I'll try to see if I can pick them in. But we predict a patient's response to drugs and different treatments. So for example, in the case of heart failure, there may be medicinal treatment, there may be uh, physical therapy treatment. Which one should a physician pursue given a particular patient is unknown. In the case of sickle cell anemia, there is a drug that can potentially alleviate the symptoms. However, the particular drug is used in um, combat against cancer. It's a chemotherapy, therefore it's gonna have severe side effects. Whether it's worth a patient take the drug or not, that, those kinds of predictive models we have developed and we continue to study. Uh, clinical decision systems, whether um, a so in emergency room, when a person comes in, what patient should be considered first ahead of the other patient as far as the triage goes? So under some circumstances, reordering of the patients can not only save money, but at the same time can increase patient outcome and lead to better patient experience. And then furthermore, in social, uh, some of the social health related um, topics such as obesity, such as smoking, drug addiction, and all of these basically human behavior, we also engage by studying human behavior by looking at uh, sensor devices, wearable sensors in order to be able to detect causal, develop and detect causes of particular human behavior, see if we can assist for example, in weight loss or cessation of smoking. So those are at the patient level. And at the molecular level, we do genomic research. What is the genetic basis of diseases? For example, in this day and age, directly related to COVID-19, it is peculiar that 
there are everybody in the population that gets exposed to, to COVID-19, some acquire it, some don't. It is also peculiar that some among the group of people who are infected by the disease, some are very non-symptomatic, some they do not have mild symptoms, whereas others perish. So the difference between all of these is that the genomic differences between people, some people are more susceptible than others. There are other peculiarities in health that we just do not know how to explain, so just, such as there are people who come exposed to secondhand smoking briefly, they develop lung cancer, and then there are people who smoke like chimney for all of their lives, but they develop nothing related to lung cancer. We cannot explain those other than propensity of individuals to individual diseases. So at the genomic proteomic level, we would like to understand what is the basis of diseases. And this essentially establishes our foundation to personalize medicine. If we can understand at the molecular level, at the genomic level, what my personality, what my um, propensities are, then we can associate that with every single person. We can, for one person, say, you may suffer from cardiac arrest at some point, therefore it's important for you to keep your cardiovascular system healthy, whereas for some other people, maybe muscular skeletal um, things that are going to take you down. So it's, it's, we can personalize healthcare based on the construct of the individual person. So digging into this computing in the world of biophysics and therefore in the world of medicine, what I'd like to do is just give you some really fundamental vocabulary and concepts that maybe I can build on it. So everybody almost these days is somewhat familiar with the concept of genes and related to computer science, we can think of genes as being um, the programming or the operating system of a cell. So genes are really what govern the entire function of the cell. So in theory, if we can gain access to genome, if we can understand what it is doing and then alter its behavior, its content, we can really solve any kind of medical and health related diseases. But the problem is that it is the, at the genetic level, we have very difficult time accessing genome and on top of it to try to modify it. So that is actually a major ethical issue as well as technological issue. But on the other hand, proteins are really kind of like you can think of it as the operational elements of a cell. So gene says what to do and proteins go about and perform their function. So the functional elements of cell are really proteins. Or if you want to think of it as a cell being a factory, the workers of this factory would then be analogous to proteins. So proteins are the ones that are performing all the physiological, biological functions at the molecular level. They are easier to access and intercept and control. And therefore, as part of the pharmaceutical drug development, we can target proteins uh, easier. So it's much better to look at proteins there is not the ethical issue of where, whether we are modifying somebody's genome and therefore their entire existence. We are just simply interfering with the process of disease. Now, the complications, uh, so furthermore, nearly every disease can be traced back to some sort of a dysfunctional protein or a network of proteins. So proteins become of critical importance for us to target, understand, and therefore maybe modify. The challenges in studying proteins is that humans, so every one of us at the cellular level, so every one single cell in our body basically is constructor of approximately 100,000 proteins. Now, each one of these proteins, if one was to study, it would take by the traditional experimental methods of protein structure calculation, it would take about one year of data collection and, and analysis. It would cost nearly $1 million. And not every protein is, can be studied by the experimental methods that we currently have. And then add another layer of complexity in that one, that my protein construct is different than anybody else in the world. And therefore, if we need to understand my molecular basis of existence, we need to characterize all the 100,000 proteins in me. So 
take 100,000 proteins in individual people, multiply it by billions of people in the world, multiply it by a euro per protein, million dollar per protein becomes very cost inhibitive and very time um, constrained processes. Clearly infeasible at the current level of um, our technology. And this provides the motivation of why just, why not just come up with alternative and computational methods of structure calculation. And if we can do that, we can study all proteins. So this last item that basically says proteins are different in different people and not all proteins can be studied. Nearly all of these elements will be removed because we can just, computational powers are cheap. We just buy more computers and we just dedicate them to this particular task and it would be essentially doable. So sort of naive expectation, but still uh, a reasonable goal for the future. So for instance, to give you an example of molecular basis of diseases and some of the detailed differences that can cause diseases is sickle cell anemia. So sickle cell anemia is, uh, is a disease related to a protein called hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is a protein that essentially carries oxygen throughout our bodies. And what you see in this uh, image on top is the hemoglobin of a normal adult. And on the bottom, you see the hemoglobin of a sickle cell uh, anemia disease patient or subject. And they are identical. They function in exactly the same way. And it does, the sickle cell anemia does have one benefit that it renders a person immune to um, malaria. And that's speculated to be its evolutionary origin. And that's why it kind of originated in Africa as well. However, it has the side effects that if people have sickle cell anemia, they episodically, periodically, a portion of their body essentially swells up. It's very painful, it's very cumbersome, and at the end process, it leads to amputation of that body part. And so one day maybe in your foot, the next day maybe in your arm, and the origin of this particular disease was unknown. And the origin turns out to be the single point mutation that my mouse is pointing to, and it is uh, colored in green. That one spot on the protein essentially renders this protein sticky. Um, so it's hydrophobic, but in you know, more common language, it becomes sticky. So two of these proteins that are adjacent to each other, they have, um, let me start this over again. Okay, so it didn't rotate. So these sticky parts are really at the opposite ends of the protein. So what this will do, this sticky ends will come together and it essentially facilitates a process of self-assembly of these proteins. These proteins self-assemble on top of each other and they become a rod-like shape and these rod-like shape ultimately block the passage of blood in very narrow blood vessels, essentially blocking flow of uh, blood and therefore your various body parts swell. So it's a very minor change, but it causes a huge problem and the origin of it is at the molecular basis. So this is a disease. It's clearly something that it gets in the way of life. However, imagine if one could leverage this exact mechanism in the process of uh, self-assembly in applications of industrial applications. Imagine having wires that if they are broken, they will reconstruct themselves. Imagine car bodies that if you're dented, they will correct themselves. So this whole process of self-assembly is, is the cause of uh, sickle cell anemia, but at the same time, it kind of opens the gate for possible engineering of proteins that can assemble in order to create useful structures. So understanding proteins and their function in their origin at the very molecular basis can help us understand diseases, potentially can then um, inspire us to implement new ways of engineering. So um, now proteins function in variety of ways. Some of the examples are immune response, locomotion, transport, metabolism, and so on and so forth. 
So what I'm showing here in the upper, um, upper picture on your right-hand side is the construct of what's called actin myosin proteins and how they interact. And that is the exact molecular basis of locomotion for all moving things. So you and I can move our bodies because at the molecular level, there are these proteins that really grab each other and pull on each other, like going up a rope. And that allows the, um, allows the movement of muscles, the compression of muscles. Um, at the same time, there are other moving parts that allow for transport of material that's in the lower end. What you're seeing is a fairly accurate depiction of what happens in your cells. There are these tubules that one can look at them as highways that connect different sources and destinations. And along those lines are proteins that know how to walk along these tubes. And on the other end, they are very specific in binding material. So they can transport material from outside of the cell into inside of the cell and they can expel material from inside the cell to the outside of the cell. So the process by which your body absorbs nutrients is related to this. Some reasons why when you are infected with let's say common cold and you have your nose that's running is related to these, that there are vesicles with digested parts of bacteria and uh, organisms that get expelled, transported and expelled outside of the cells. So proteins can perform a variety of functions, but one of the things I'd like to bring to your attention is this immune response. And immune response becomes the thing that these days we are concerned about because of the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Incidentally, one of the things that was shocking to me at, uh, when I was embarking in this career to know is that there is a mechanism of cell death. Cells repair themselves when they can. So this repair is a function of a cell, but in instances when cell know that their damage is beyond repair, they start a process of cell death, that they can process a signal, initiate a signal that says, kill yourself, and cells essentially commit suicide. And one of the things, for example, that viruses, when they infect us, and other diseases such as cancer, one of the very first things that they do is disable the process of cell death. So they cannot commit their suicide and therefore the disease continues to propagate throughout the organism. So let me also show you a brief example of how proteins are produced in, 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 at the cellular level especially for, let's say, for example, humans and mammals and eukaryotes. Let me start this. And I'm not sure if you guys, you guys probably can't hear this. So let me just narrate this as this is going along. So what this oh, is- We can hear it, just so you know. Okay, great. So I'm just gonna leave it like this because the other person does a better job. Let me, let me stop at this point and add to this an emphatic point that I'm going to come back to later on in my talk. This entire complex right now, you see it in purple. It's the protein synthesis machinery of the cell called ribosome. And it is the only thing that produces proteins. So anything in the cell needs proteins, somehow communicates with this machinery and says, I need more of the following protein and the protein is then constructed. It's a large thing, but at the end of it, it produces the protein that right now is attached to it and it's gonna be released soon. Let me, I'm, I'm not going to show the rest of this. I think what is this far is enough to um, make my point. 
So what you see here, this string, this is called messenger RNA. That's a message that comes to this ribosome and says, I need you to make the following protein. And this ribosome then produces the protein that's needed. And those proteins are the ones that I showed in the previous example as they're functional. These include structural proteins. These are the proteins that literally hold things up. These are proteins that will go about and perform metabolism that help to digest sugar, food, lipids. But these are also the molecules that engage in our immune system. So if this ribosome is, is dysfunctional, is turned off, our immune system falls apart. And this is one of the starting points of COVID-19 or any other disease, for example. So this protein is the way that our body starts to produce immune response molecules that then go about and fight all infections. So keep this in mind, I'm gonna come back to it later. Actually, I'm gonna put this aside. <clears throat> so <clears throat> how is it, so far I have told you the, the advantage of computing in the world of medicine and um, maybe biology, healthcare, and I have given you a little bit of background in biology, but it may not necessarily be clear how computer science can contribute to this. And let me show you some of the obviously machine learning, pattern recognition, data mining, all of those are at the forefront of doing this. But the part that you may not see is the hardcore computational modeling that goes um, actually right now is the only approach that we have in combat against COVID-19, which is where I'm going with this, is the thing that I want to, the application that I want to show you. But let me show you generally how we use combined physics, mathematics, and computing in order to understand biology. So there is this concept of molecular mechanics that essentially uses classical physics, Newtonian physics, in order to understand the stability of things is by investigating the potential energy and look at all the forces that are being applied to a thing. So it's nothing more than Newtonian physics that is used to calculate the internal energies of molecules, including proteins. And that energy, which sometimes we refer to potential energy calculated from a force field, is used in order to assess whether a protein is functional or not, whether a protein is stable or not. And it can therefore be used in order to model and predict function and structure of a molecule. And we do that typically in the field that entire total potential energy of the molecules calculated based on an empirical term and an effective term. And so far in practice, the empirical term has had a little bit of impact, but the effective term, which is all the information and constraints that comes from the experimental methods that imposes a one-year required data acquisition and analysis, $1 million cost comes all from this effective term. The empirical term are all the things that we can calculate from physics-based approach, and it's free to compute. So at the current state, we almost don't use much of the empirical term. We rely on effective but the computational modeling kind of aims to remove the effective term and primarily work with the empirical term. Uh, if in the empirical term, we basically aggregate our knowledge of biophysics. So in there, for any two given atoms that are directly bonded to each other from quantum physics and from experimental observation, we have, we have knowledge about what should be the optimal bond distance between any two points. Therefore, any departure from ideal bond length can be penalized based on this equation shown that constitutes the potential fitness based on the distances of the bonds. We can do a similar thing for, three any, for any three consecutively bonded atoms we know an ideal angle geometry that sometimes it should be 180, sometimes it should be 120 degrees, sometimes they have to be 109.5 degrees. So if there is any departure from known geometry can be penalized based on this particular equation. And similarly, there is improper terms where 
there are a collection of atoms in space that should always adhere to a particular geometry. So in this case, you're shown two different groups of atoms that they should always be in a planar conformation with respect to each other. If these atoms are not in a plane, that construct should be penalized given by this particular equation. And then there are additional terms. Terms, uh, so these are all the terms that we kind of uh, can easily quantify and I kind of went over them pictorially. There are additional terms such as van der Waal. Van der Waal energy terms are very poorly understood. We do not understand the basis of them, but we can very accurately model them. Electrostatic terms are very well understood. This is where we know positive charges repel, negative charges repel, by opposite charges uh, attract each other. This is very well understood and model. Then there are other terms, hydrophobic, hydrophilic interaction, hydrogen bondings, that uh, to some extent they have been understood and model. We collect all of those and we throw them into one big equation in order to calculate the fitness of a structure and whether a given structure is stable. So this is a very big function to calculate. And this is where, um, this is usually in the order of 10,000 dimensional space that you can perform optimization over it. So you can see how this would be actually a very compute intensive and very challenging thing to do. What I wanna do at this point, I wanna come to give you an example of So this is one example of a very small protein where we can then apply these energy calculations and we can apply it um, in order to fold this particular protein. And as we are performing the molecular dynamic simulation, you can see that the little molecules, these are water molecules that are moving around and my system is really bogged down for the next molecule that I need to show you. It's a uh, it's related to actually to COVID-19. It's really consuming much of my computational power here. So this can be used in order to study the movement of the molecules through time, through their interaction with water and each other. So you can model this. We can model this entire folding of the protein and interaction between every single atom. Let me put this aside here. And I'm gonna actually, I'll leave it alone. <clears throat> so the applications that we have applied, you know, the, the, all of this molecular mechanics, molecular dynamic simulations to a variety of cases, but the one that I'd like to highlight today are two different systems that we are currently studying in COVID-19. So as I'm sure many of you know, the Severe acute respiratory syndrome or SARS, in particular, the second version of the SARS CoV 2, is the virus that, is, um, is, that causes the COVID 19 pandemic. It's been around for a year. And if you were to go back to some of the things that I said, that it costs a million dollars to study, a whole year to study it that really becomes the basis of why we really don't know what COVID-19 is doing and how it operates. COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 in total has about 30 proteins that constitutes its entire existence. However, those 30 proteins are expensive to study and they're gonna take a long time for us to study. Now, we have developed computational methods that investigates two different systems in COVID-19. One of them I'm sure you're familiar with is called spike protein. The other one is a less known protein called non-structure protein one. And each one of them plays a very critical role in the life cycle of, uh, of COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2. Spike protein in particular is the first step in viral infection. And I will show you what this is. This is the one that's actually consuming much of my uh, computer's power at this point. So spike is a protein that's just as the term suggests is the spike protein that sits on the surface of coronavirus. And as the very first step, it needs to mount itself on human cell before it can infect the human cell. 
that particular step takes place by spike protein binding to ACE protein in the, in the human respiratory lungs, basically. So the question is, how does that work? And that also relates to these different variants of COVID-19 that we are observing these days. NSP1, on the other hand, initiates the very first critical step of initiating the synthesis of the, of the viral organism, the entire virus itself. So once the spike protein attaches, once virus is attached to human cell, it injects its DNA material, in this case, RNA material into the host and infects the cell. And the very, very first step of the infection is that NSP1 performs two critical functions. One of them, it disables the synthesis of all host proteins, therefore disables the immune system of the host. So when NSP1, when COVID-19 infects us, it renders that ribosomal complex that I showed you earlier, renders that inactive. So that no longer produces the immune proteins that we need in order to combat it. But at the same time, the same complex ribosomal complex that does not produce human proteins, it accelerates the synthesis and production of the viral proteins. And this is unknown and very peculiar. It basically selectively sits there and kind of monitors the protein synthesis process and says, if you are a human related protein, I am not going to allow you to be synthesized. But if you are a viral protein, then I'm going to let you be synthesized. And in fact, I'm going to accelerate this production. So we kind of want to understand this process better too. And it really begs the requirement for computational techniques. The experimental methods is going to take years and decades to actually characterize this whole thing. I'm going to just show you briefly what we have done with the NSP1. And from there, um, then go into a little bit of modeling stuff that we have done with the spike protein. So first, we want to talk about NSP1. If you remember that big ribosomal protein that actually synthesizes all the proteins in the, in the human cell is shown, a big portion of it is shown in kind of yellow gold on the left-hand side. NSP1 is a protein that we have managed to identify that this particular protein inserts itself into this cavity where it's the gateway to production of the protein. So this guy goes and lodges itself in there and it acts as a gateway. Essentially what happens when the viral RNA comes in that says, I need viral proteins to be synthesized, it allows it to be attached to this bigger protein and then be um, characterized. Whereas if it is a human protein that is RNA for human production comes along, it rejects that and sets it away. So it basically sits here as, a, as an attenuating feature that allows certain RNA to be uh, to be converted to proteins and certain RNAs not to be converted to proteins. So this is, so far we have managed to identify this and we are currently investigating how is it that RNA from viruses recognized by this whole process and how is it that RNA produced by the host humans is rejected. So we are currently actually working on that part. And then I'm gonna skip over this uh, stability stuff and let me show you this particular. Sorry, let me. So what you're seeing in here, let me turn things on and off properly. So this entire thing is the spike protein that the spike protein is a protein that kind of protrudes from the surface of the, of the coronavirus. This is the part that connects to ACE protein. ACE protein is what is depicted in blue here. This blue protein that sits on the surface of human cell and spike protein that sits on the surface of the coronavirus, somehow they attract each other and they combine and that sticky behavior allows mounting of coronavirus onto human cells. Once it is connected, then essentially the transfer of the genetic material takes place. NSP1 starts to function. This allows 
any kind of synthesis of the immune system, immune response proteins, but replicates the viral parts than viral parts assemble and then infect even more. So in this particular process, we have identified, so this has been actually identified by other sources, but what we are currently doing is trying to characterize the strength of interaction between these two subunits. And of particular interest is, I'm gonna put these away now, So what you are seeing here these three dots that are shown in red so I have removed part of the protein part of the actual um, spike protein in order to make it easier to see the spike protein at the end of it has these three points that clearly connect to the ace protein those are the three proteins that if they are mutated, they become the South African variant of the coronavirus. And because the South African variant of the coronavirus are more sticky, they actually kind of facilitate a stronger connection between the spike protein and the ACE protein. Therefore, they actually connect to each other faster, therefore explaining the transmissibility, the higher transmissibility of the, of the South African variant. This is a mechanism that we are now in the current, currently in the process of publishing. And this can be used in order to detect ahead of time whether there are variants that are being kind of developed in our society that might act as a more virulent versions of COVID-19. So that way we can be better uh, in charge of the, the governed about the process of um, um, contact tracing a little bit more effectively. So if a person who is infected with SARS-CoV-2 that is far more virulent than the other ones, this mechanism can identify it. Therefore, exposure of that one person can be more closely monitored and therefore contained. So um, these are some of the current applications that you're working on in relation to COVID-19. What I wanted to highlight is that when you actually embark on research in the areas of uh, computational biology, you really don't need to know much about biology. You, your knowledge of computer science is, is enough for you to straight jump into these things. So don't be shy about the topic simply because you do not know biology, because you didn't take biology, because you don't even like biology. After the superficial description of the problem, there is nothing more than computing and mathematics and calculations behind the scenes. So people who embark in computational biology in my lab, they can take in many different aspects that they can pursue their interests. It can be high performance computing. As you can see, just showing you the things, I'm not calculating anything behind the scenes, I'm just displaying it for you, is intensive enough that my computer slows down. So it can go on to the area of CPU and GPU computing. It can go into parallel computing. It can go high performance computing. It can be software engineering that you just simply develop tools that assist with analyses. There are projects that are highly purely mathematical and statistical. Therefore, they don't even get to a point of being implemented on um, at, at the point of software engineering. So all of these take place in Mathematica and Maple, MATLAB, R, so they are in that platform that are being developed. Clearly, we use machine learning and artificial intelligence in order to assist and improve at least the calculations that uh, we need to perform. It directly impacts healthcare and has high societal impact. Over the last year, DHEC has recruited probably 10 members of my lab. There are, and they're still looking. So it is something that you can directly relate and you can say that our work is actually impacting society. And I am looking for long-term and short-term individuals to come and assist with small projects or with large projects. If you're interested in participating in my lab's research, let me know, please uh, touch base with me, send me an email and I'm happy to meet with you and discuss any of the other projects. 
And I'd like to thank you, thank Dr. Sheff for inviting me. And if there are questions, if there are any other projects that you want to see something about, uh, chances are I do have slides here. I'm happy to answer questions. All right, questions, guys. Uh, uh, really informative talk. Uh, as you can see, a lot of exciting things going on and a lot of uh, timely things. Questions? It's more of a question about the uh, service that you guys provide. Um, in the beginning of the talk, you, you said that you encourage your students and people in your lab to um, provide service and uh, training to uh, people that you work with. Are we, um, are our students allowed to join that even if they're not in your lab? Uh, yes, it's just that at that point, it's yes, absolutely. The question is that what does the student get out of it? Clearly, there is the teaching kind of experience to teach other people. But in general, it's not a bad thing at that point to, to get a little bit more. So generally, part of what I do is pay my students potentially for summer if they can perform cover one of these workshops. So then there is also a financial benefit as well. Right? Okay. But yes, we can always use other people who have other expertise who are willing to do this. This sometimes turns out to be a challenging thing, for example, to teach Linux to whole bunches of biologists. Mm -hmm. And in fact, not even biologists, you can even go to in computer science, people get attached to their mice. And to motivate them why you need to give up your mouse and sit at the terminal and do command line execution of things becomes sometimes challenging. Mm -hmm. However, in the world of research, there are a lot of programs that are developed only for Linux, no other platform. And they are just command line based programs. They do not have GUI. Uh, so then it becomes necessary to, that, to do that. So, But yes, if anybody's interested in just uh, in uh, it being involved in that aspect, that's perfectly fine too. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Balafa, for the great presentation. Uh, I'd like to ask what's the driving force of the motor uh, molecules, the one you showed in the slides that- Right, so let me see if I can bring it up. Yeah. So these particular molecules, the world of biology has actually, let me also share my screen, has, um, has addressed a lot of things that in engineering we have not. So let me, so can you see my slide? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so unfortunately this guy stopped moving. But so in this complex, this particular head of this particular protein that keeps uh, cocking itself up and down, it has this end that is sticky and that sticky end then sticks to this other string of proteins. Also, this guy connects to something called ATP. ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is a molecule that's derived from sugar. So you can think of it as a byproduct of sugar that packs a lot of energy and it's ready to be burned. So you can think of it um, from analogy point of view and almost accurately as this gunpowder loaded capsule that comes and connects here. It just needs to be ignited in order to explode that explosion. Then it's going to cock this head of this protein and it's going to help to propel itself up the string. And you can ask the question of, so then what controls this? So driving energy comes from that at the ATP molecule that is packed with energy. And the way it turns it on and off is what this depicted as the yellow molecule. And this one is calcium. So when your brain wants to say arm move, it sends an electrical signal from your brain to your arm. That electrical signal, when it comes to your arm, at that point, it triggers a particular part of your muscle, muscle cell that has a container filled with calcium. 
that container releases the calcium. The moment the calciums are released, all of these actin myosins begin to uh, process their ATP and they begin to perform their cocking left and right and therefore the muscles contract. And the moment that your brain says, okay, stop moving, all these calcium ions are extracted from inside the cell and put in a compartment safely away from these actin myosin complexes. So the, the energy comes from ATP, the control comes from calcium. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor. That's, that's very interesting. That's why you know your physician is going to tell you you need to you know take all your vitamins that has calcium, potassium. Uh, so you kind of need to have all your minerals. Anything else? All right. Um, if not, we can uh, end uh, this particular session here. Um, I have posted what we're going to cover in the next uh, class. Okay. Well, thank you.